monologue. Okay, um, this is not supposed to be a monologue. And so if uh, people have questions, uh, you know, uh, feel free to ask the questions um, uh, or to uh, um, write them in uh, and uh, we will get to them um, um, as we see them. And also I have invited uh, a number, a couple of people um, to join me on this panel um, who have some experiences uh, in uh, what this um, webinar is all about, which is lessons learned by new movers. And boy, sure, there are sure a lot of lessons that are learned. And we're not going to be able to cover them all today, but um, I want to introduce um, uh, I'll introduce Chris Nado first. Uh, Chris uh, is um, a local uh, financial guy, um, and we're going to talk a little bit, uh, and Chris is going to talk a little bit, actually, um, uh, during the uh, uh, webinar about why it's really important to have a local lender involved and how it really benefits uh, everybody uh, in the process. I've and, also uh, And Caitlin just joined. Oh, great. And then um, um, Andrea and Dan are, are going to join us and they um, they bought a home uh, in the Lakes District and um, they had a number of ex uh, great experiences with that, uh, including, yeah. uh, and I hope to talk about this, you know, well, how much fun it is to buy a property in the middle of winter when everything <laughs> is snow covered. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you're going to have to expect, in, at least in part of New, of New Hampshire, is that uh, there are parts where in the winter, that's exactly what you're going to get. So, and then um, Caitlin and Nathan are joining us. Um, and they had their experiences. Oh my Lord! I'm they. They must have made forty offers or so uh, before they settled on their home. Maybe even more than that. And so that's another experience that we're going to we're going to talk about because as I as I, as I start this thing and and before I even move to the first slide, let me let me just say that the marketplace that we're in today. It's probably one that if we've never seen before, at least I, I certainly haven't seen it before, and I doubt very many agents have seen it before. The sellers market is so hot that when a property goes on uh, the um, on the listing or to, to be um, sold, it, it can go on one day and be gone the next. And if you look at if you look at another way of looking at it, if you look at the amount of inventory that's on the marketplace, it is really low. And you compare that to the number of people who want to come into the state, um, which is really high. You know, I've, I, can, I can go to um, I can go to a um, um, open house and there will be cars around the block waiting to see that open house. Well, you can then expect there's going to be an awful lot of offers coming in. And, um, and that property is, is not going to last more than a day or so before it is, it is put under contract. So Porcupine Real Estate, um, we have experience with this. And um, um, one of the things that we do is we, ha we have um, some strategies that we will share with you today. And, uh, um, and as a team, um, try to uh, show you how, what the best way is um, to, to work through these issues that you're going to face in, um, in, in moving here to New Hampshire and finding a home. Anyway, um, with that said, um, let's see, I think I'm ready to move on here. Okay, let's see, I just got to... I have to click on this thing says that I'm recording this. There we go. Okay, slides change. <laughs> well, the first issue is um, I can't get my slides to change. Interesting. Hmm. This is a little embarrassing. The reason, one of the reasons is, is that um, 
I was uh, having some problems with my computer, so I borrowed one of my colleagues' uh, computer to do this, and the um, the uh, the buttons to switch switch the slides are not the same as on mine. So, hmm. hold on one second. I'll be right back. Um, start thinking about your questions, and I'll get, we'll get to them. Okay, how do we do this on your computer? Yeah. Okay, yeah, this is a problem I had with it. When it's not in Zoom, it's fine. Okay, so how do we do it? How do you do this? Wait, the first let me just do that. Okay, let me just see if I can do it. Did I do it? Um, this way for far. Oh, here we go again. Is that no, I've got to go way back. Go, go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning? Yeah. Okay, just, yeah, this doesn't work for some reason. Oh. Okay, now, is that it? Okay, let's go back. Okay, yeah. Oh, we're going to go back. We went too far. Do it again. It's very sensitive. Okay, here we are. So, thank you. <laughs> Is everybody still with me? <laughs> or have you all gone to sleep by now? All right, so the first thing is, um, we we'll gonna talk about is uh, how, to, how to pick an area. And, you know, maybe um, uh, it would be, uh, maybe this is a good time to bring in um, um, Caitlin. Hi, Caitlin. Caitlin? Can I unmute myself? Is that okay? Yeah, you're good. We can hear you. Okay. I didn't want to be uncouth and unmute myself preemptively. Uh, hi, everyone. Chris, I didn't know you'd be on here. I love you. Hi. So, Caitlin, um, one of the things that I would think you'd be great for you to is talk about um, what issues you had in, in picking an area, because I know you certainly went through one heck of a mm. number of, uh, of uh, offers in different areas. Yes. yes, how much time do we have, Michael? I fear that there <laughs> may not be enough for us to discuss the issues that I had. Constance and Chris well, are laughing because they were on that journey with me. <laughs> maybe you could just pick the top two or three. Yes, no, I'm, I'm joking. I can keep it the yeah. same. Um, and I'm so sorry. Will you repeat the original question so I can focus my answer? I've already forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, um, you know, um, one of the issues that uh, people coming in from out of state have is mm -hmm. um, New Hampshire is so diverse. I'm in the, in the, just so many different um, climates and different uh, geographical areas and uh, um, that uh, it's really it's really difficult to, to um, for them to figure out where they want to be. And so I know you looked all over the state, really. Yes. Yeah. So in terms of like my process, um, for a little bit of context, I moved from Washington and we knew we wanted to be in New Hampshire for a number of reasons, but we were kind of open in terms of where we both work remotely, luckily. Um, so one of the things that I did when we were starting to try to figure out where to look was kind of gathering data. I made a very... <laughs> thorough spreadsheet, um, trying to kind of suss out what things we were looking for in an area, you know, kind of starting with, okay, what do we value? What are we prioritizing? And then you kind of take that and you weigh it against what these different areas offer. So what I ended up with was pinpointing certain towns that, for example, maybe had like a really low tax rate or um, because my husband and I are planning to start a family, you know, we would look at schools in that area. So, you know, personal preferences. Um, but ultimately the market was so crazy when we looked, which was last summer, that we kind of had to just be open to anywhere. We were as far north as Littleton. We were as far south as Ringe. We were as far west as Westmoreland. We were as far east as Rochester. We essentially covered the entire state. Um, so what does it? <laughs> yeah, which was, it was crazy. I mean, we 
literally put in eight offers. We literally saw, I think, 82 houses. So it was, it was wild. Um, I don't know that that, I hope that won't be necessary for people looking now, <laughs> but I know you said at the beginning, Michael, that it's still kind of a crazy market. Um, so I think that's the best way to empower yourself if you're moving from out of state and you're not super familiar with particular areas, just kind of decide what it is you're looking for because there will be lots of options and it can feel a little overwhelming to try to be deciding between so many areas. Um, the other thing is just if inventory remains limited that you may have to branch out. And so being prepared and coming into it with the mindset of like, I'm fixated on, I really want this area or like this kind of house, it may be wise to be open to not having that area or that kind of house. Um, you have to really want to live in New Hampshire, I think, to buy a house in New Hampshire right now. <laughs> you have to really be committed to the state uh, because ultimately you'll end up in New Hampshire. It may not be where you thought. I certainly didn't think I'd be in the town that I am, but um, you know, we're, we're very happy. And uh, yeah, does that answer? Those yeah, I always over explain, but hopefully no, I, I think that I think that's great. I mean, you know, one of the um, one of the things that's frustrating, I think, both for clients that are coming into the state and also for agents is that um, um, uh, you know, somebody can fly in on a Friday and they said, you know, we'd like to see three or four houses on Saturday, three or four houses on Sunday. Uh, and um, um it's just it's just very difficult in this marketplace to set anything up that quickly. Um, the agents are busy, or um, um, the houses that they actually they looked at when they looked on through Zillow or for the realtor. By the time they get here, those houses are gone, and um, so uh, it it's really I think if somebody wants to come in. Don't come in on a Friday and, and think you're going to be able to do work something on a Saturday or a Sunday. Come in earlier, come in on a Wednesday and spend a couple of days, you know, looking at an areas and, um, and trying to pinpoint a couple of uh, uh, different geographical areas that you're interested in. Um, and then let your agent know, um, you know, that you're going to, those are the areas. And then um, that way they can focus on those areas. And then by, by a Friday, Saturday, a Sunday timeframe, I'll have a chance to have gotten hold of the um, uh, the agents, uh, the listing agents for those places, and um, um, set something up. I'm trying to set a few things up each of those days. Now, the other thing about um, I was want to mention about Porcupine uh, as a real estate company. We're really a team. So, um, as as Caitlin said, I mean, she looked north, south, east, and west, and now and not every agent is going to be available every day to go north, west, east, and south. So we do work as a team. And um, so for instance, if I have, if you want to see something in the, uh, in the, on the Vermont border, and I happen to be tied up uh, that day, or you have agents that can that will fill in and, 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 and work with me and you to do that. So um, mm -hmm. you, you, you don't get just one agent here. You get, you get the whole team. Yeah. Um, okay, so then let's see if we can move on here. If I did this correctly, uh -huh, it works. Uh, are there towns that have less government regulations and lower taxes? Yes, indeed. One of the things that um, uh, is so almost unique about uh, New Hampshire is that so much of the, um, the re government regulations and the tax regulations are governed on a local basis. And uh, so you can, you, can have, um, you can have a town that um, uh, has high regulations and high taxes and five miles away from that, you can have a complete flip where you have very low regulations and very and very low taxes, and so uh, one of the things that uh, Porcupine can will help you with is to is to point you in a direction. Most almost all of our clients, um, not one hundred percent, but most of our clients come come here because they they. They either want the law regulations, the, the free state project type people, or we're getting a lot of clients that are coming up from um, uh, Massachusetts and from New York and from Connecticut who want out of the high, high tax areas into um, a state where they can work from home and they don't have any uh, um, state income tax. So um, yes, definitely um, 
um, you, 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 it, 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 it's going to take some study, um, but definitely there are there are definitely areas that uh, have uh, far fewer taxes, far lower taxes, far fewer regulations, um, and um, we can help you in identifying where those are. Is it best to use a local lender? Hey, Chris, this is where you can jump in and help us. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is always hard for me because, you know, I feel like I'm trying to sell myself and it's the last thing I want to do. I, I would rather have other people that have worked with me to explain what their process was like working with me. Um, I can tell you that I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been with Porcupine since they started. I've helped countless people move into the state. So I know what it takes to move from one state to here, what the guidelines are going to be. I know what it will be to help get you in the best situation possible. So when you do find a house that we can try to keep the documentation process as limited as possible, which is better for, you know, for, for everyone. Well, as far as the local lending side goes, from what I've seen, it probably comes in best when your offers are being made. Um, you know, one of the things I've done for years is when an offer is submitted, I always have, you know, Michael or any of the other agents to copy me on it so I can contact the listing agent and advocate on your behalf. And when agents see a letter written from someone local, you know, and I've been in this for a long time, there's a lot of agents that I know. So if they see my name, it goes a long way. But if they see me over some you know, mortgage.com or some other company out of another state, they're definitely going to be more inclined to use a local person just because it's the type of state that New Hampshire is. Um, you know, if there's a company from another state, they're far away or whatever, they just sometimes they're not as invested or they may not know as much. You know, I, I don't want to down talk another company, but in my experience from what I hear is that some of the other places they just don't have pay the you know attention to detail as much as, as i may uh, as far as any other questions you know what it would like to be to work with me versus someone else uh honestly i'll do better on a question and answer period with that than me just going into a whole bunch of stuff because i could talk about things that are of no interest to, to you so please any questions so any of this just ask me i'm happy to help Thanks. And I would love to sell Chris in case anybody needs an endorsement. And I understand not wanting to talk about yourself because he's, forgive my language, fucking phenomenal. So I would love to explain the difference that I, you know, that we had using him. If anyone wants it, if not, I will shut up. I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you, Chris, can you talk a little bit about how it is to work with appraisers as a local lender versus a national lender? Sure. Quite honestly, there probably isn't a whole much of a difference at all. Uh, unfortunately, the Dodd-Frank bill stripped every bank, lending institution, everything uh, from being able to know who the appraiser is when, when an appraiser appraisal is requested. So we legally are not allowed, even though we're responsible for getting the appraiser out there, we are legally not allowed to know who the appraiser is until we get the report back and appraisals have to be ordered through a middleman company to keep it 100% separate. And appraisals really aren't even ordered, they're requested. They're just called ordered because back in the day, you actually used to call the appraiser and order an appraisal. Uh, it was done by fax, <laughs> quite honestly. But now, you know, once someone goes under agreement, we submit a request to the management company for that appraisal to be done. And then they send it out to the appraisers that are on their list and an appraiser literally has to accept that. So when you're in a remote town um, or in a very complicated property, your appraisal is going to cost more and take longer to get done because the appraisers, uh, obviously on this, I can't say that they are definitely cherry picking, but it seems to be that they are selecting the ones that they want to do over ones they do not want to do. 
And unfortunately, these are nationwide guidelines. So no one company is going to be able to tell you in the beginning that they guarantee they can get an appraisal done in X amount of time where they're just flat out lying. Um, yeah, also, Chris, you know, it's, um, there are, you know, within New Hampshire, there are local New Hampshire um, lending um, opportunities um, for like um, uh, multi-units. Um, and um, I guess uh, I know that you're an expert in that as well. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, it's, you know, buying homes definitely just not for a single family house. We can look at whether you're looking to come and buy a vacation home or you want a house that's going to help pay for it, but, you know, being a multifamily property, or you really are just looking for a single family house. We can look at all sorts of different types of loan products for you. And, and that's the other thing, you know, not one product fits everyone. Uh, out of 20 years of doing this, I can say that almost everyone that's come to me and said, my cousin, my uncle, my so-and-so has told me that this is what I need to do, that not one person has done that particular thing. And it's just because everyone's situation is different. So I, I like to get to know what you're looking to do, what your goals are. And then once I have your information, I can really help tailor the loan product to suit your needs the best and explain why that works. And every product, every home you're going for, is going to have a slightly different loan product. It's going to have different requirements for it. what the requirements are for a single family house are not the same for a multifamily home. And how is uh, crypto um, being um, accepted these days now by, by the lending institutions? Technically it's allowed. However, like all things that comes with fine print. So crypto is allowed if you can prove and show basically that uh, state monthly statements for it. just like your 401k or your bank statement has will your, your bank account will produce a monthly statement. If your crypto is in an exchange that will produce a monthly statement, then it's okay. If it's with an exchange or in a wallet that is private, then unfortunately you would not be able to use it. We have to be able to show that it's yours and show the history of it and everything always requires a two month history. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's uh, move on. I live out of state. How can I find a place to live when I can't get to New Hampshire regularly? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I mean, so many of, um, of Porcupine's clients are uh, out-of-state people coming from as far about, uh, uh, west as California, um, um, that uh, it's, and especially in this market, as we talked about earlier, that where things move so fast, how can, how can, how can this happen? Well, there are, there are a couple of things that you, we can do. I and mean, one of the things that, uh, that uh, have been pretty successful with, and then not everybody's comfortable with this, and that is that, uh, uh, as an agent, I will go out and videotape um, and, and be online with you through uh, Zoom or uh, um, um, WhatsApp, uh, uh, as you can actually actually can see the pro property uh, real time and uh, ask questions about it. Um, and um, it's not a perfect way to do it. Uh, because there's always, you know, things that you would see if you were there right in person um, that you probably won't get to see in the video. But as, as I've gotten more experience with videoing and, and um, uh, answering questions, I get, I've got a pretty good backlog of, uh, of the things that uh, people want to see, like, um, you know, the height of the ceilings, um, 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 you know, how, how, how bright is the house? Uh, those are the kinds of questions that, you know, that, uh, that you would normally just uh, be obvious to, to, to you if you were there, but um, they don't normally show up that well in the video. But I think that my, over half of the, uh, the uh, um, deals that I, I personally closed last year were from people who um, saw the property not in person, but in videotape, made an offer um, from that video and um, um, purchased the house. And I think that uh, that um, they that that's been a very successful process. 
the other way to do it, of course, is um, um, come here. Uh, but, you know, don't come here on a, on a, on a longer basis, uh, either get a rental. Um, and uh, yeah, rentals can be difficult to get on a, on a longer term basis, but, but uh, you know, for, uh, for a few weeks of uh, getting an Airbnb uh, and spending some time in the state uh, is, uh, a, a, you know, a, a good way to not only learn the, uh, the geographical area and the uh, various uh, uh, differences uh, from town to town, like uh, we talked about before, either from the tax point of view or from a government regulation point of view, and something we didn't mention, and it's a big deal for a lot of people, the different school districts. Um, are very different. Um, uh, there's some very good school districts, and there's some that wouldn't qualify for the words very good. But uh, um, obviously, that's important to, to a lot of people. And um, again, this is something where um, Porcupine uh, Real Estate can actually help you with if you give us some information about what you're looking for in the school. You know, why we, why we can't say this is the school for you, you know, we definitely can give you, um, um, uh, lead you to different, uh, uh, different sites and uh, uh, sources of information that you can, you can look into this yourself too, and, and, and learn a lot about the school districts. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult from, from um, when you're from out of state and you can't get here on a regular basis. Um, but as I said, you know, we're, we're trying to um, find ways, like for the videotaping, to uh, make it possible for you to, to um, see uh, properties. And uh, in some cases, that's the only way you can do it. Because if you wait till you can get out here, uh, most likely that property is gone. Um, Okay. What happens after I find a house I like? Well, um, when you find a house you like, then um, you want to put down uh, an offer. And um, uh, there's a number of parts of this uh, in, in making an offer. Uh, one is, uh, before we get going further, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about uh, um, the issue of, uh, of when you look find a house you want to make you want to make a decision I, am i going to go through and have a full inspection of, of all of the uh, systems on that house uh, uh, what you get out here which you don't get in a lot of places you get into septic systems and um, um, you get into uh, wells and you again you have to look at the difference between a dry well and a dug well um, and uh, so you're going to have to make a decision on um, on uh, how much inspection um, and investigation do you want to go through with that property. And um, now it's true that um, in this marketplace, that is a trade off between because there's going to be a, uh, with so many people bidding for properties, there are a lot of people who will probably um, make their offer on that property uh, and and waive inspection completely. Now, there's there's risks in that, and uh, you know the um, the the porcupine agent. Um, uh, we've we've been um, we spent a lot of time um, um, looking at properties with other um, with other inspectors, uh, and so we some, we can also know what to point out, uh, um, and and then. Leave it up to you in terms of whether or not you want to make an offer or not. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll make an, uh, have an inspection with your offer. Now I can tell you that um, that sometimes that's difficult. Now Andrea and Dan they 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 bought this property and they wanted to have an inspection done of the uh, septic system. And you guys want to say what happened with that? <laughs> Hi. Um, well, we had the inspection done in the in septic and it completely failed miserably. And um, the, the owners, you know, with um, Michael was really good about negotiating with the uh, sellers and they paid for the septic to be the entire system to be replaced. And but that didn't happen until after we closed. And once they get out here to replace it, this, the, the master bath had a sewage smell in it and we weren't sure why that was but ended up 
the, the tank was never installed properly when the house was built 19 years ago. So sewage had been backing up into the house yes. all yes. those years. And the sellers afterwards had told us, you know, they, they had replaced the leach field a couple of times. They added extra venting in the house. They didn't know why. And that, that was the problem. And, you know, so grateful we did that inspection because who knows what kind of problem. Yeah. So now we have a brand new septic. So far, it's been working great. It's about a year old. And um, yeah, had we not done inspections, inspections are key. I, I know it's a bargaining tool now, but I wouldn't want to not do inspections, especially with the septic. Yeah. Yep. And I think it also depends on the age of the house and uh, how long that uh, septic system has been in place. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. But sometimes you just can't you can't get an inspection done of a septic system in the middle of the winter when the ground is totally frozen and, um, and, and do it properly. And uh, also, uh, it's very tough to ask an inspector to inspect the roof, for instance, when, when it has a foot of snow all over it. So you just have to recognize that these are some of the realities of, uh, of um, trying to buy something in the middle of, uh, of winter in New Hampshire, especially as you get further, further north. Not so bad in the southern area, but as you go up through the lakes area and up into, especially in Dakota's County, uh, this becomes a, a real, it can become a real issue. Just something to, to know that, you know, you have to make that trade off um, because your offer would be stronger if you don't do an inspection. But again, it also makes it a more risky offer uh, that you guys take the uh, responsibility for. You can put contingency clauses in the offer that says that you know that uh, um, you like to do an inspection, but you're only going. You're not going to nickel and dime the sellers over everything. So we'll only go. We'll only look. Uh, you know, be. Um, uh, be uh, interested in, in, in uh, inspections and, and problems that uh, cost above a certain amount to uh, repair. So um, yeah, so that's the best part of that's part of the uh, purchase and sales process is deciding whether you want to do the inspection. And um, uh, so, did I leave out anything I wanted to say there? If there are any questions, please ask, and uh, or we'll get to them later. Can you just comment on buying raw land and zoning? I understand Grafton has no zoning, but like, where does that fall in the process of buying? Do you acquire the land first? Do you check in with what you're allowed to build or you know whatever constraints there are from a zoning point of view? Yeah, this is an ex excellent question. Thank you very much. And, and, and Chris can also speak to this thing too, because uh, you know, it's a, it's, I mean, there is, it's a much more complicated process if you wanna go buy the land and then you have to go get all the permits and then you have to go get a, um, 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 basically a, um, a uh, financing on, on buying the property itself uh, or building the property, I should say, versus finding something where the, the land, uh, um, their, the owner of the land would be uh, willing to, uh, to uh, build uh, your custom home on it and then tie both the property, the land and the um, um, uh, st um, structure into a, a single um, uh, title and, and then have, have a uh, finance company finance that. Do you wanna say something about that, Chris? Yes, it's... Uh... So, Matt, to answer your question, uh, you know, specifically about the land and then what process to go in, if, because every town is different with their building permits, um, you know, and, and Michael would definitely be able to help you out with this too, but I know if it were me, I would, I would look to the town to see what their requirements were before making any offers on any land. So I'd, you know, I'd probably have the towns laid out that I'd wanna be looking at and that sort of thing. Um, as far as financing the land, then it comes down to what are you doing with it? Are you doing it just to sit on it or are you doing it to build on it? Um, <laughs> buying land in itself, no mortgage company is, is gonna to touch. Um, so you're definitely looking at a local bank and whether you're going to build on it or not build on it will also determine who will lend on it or not. Um, a lot of people 
are looking to build their own homes because existing homes are so expensive and they're so hard to come by. Uh, however, there's a couple things that go along with that with new construction. So the, what everyone thinks of, or not, I should say what everyone thinks of, there's two types of loans with that. One is the traditional construction loan where you finance the purchase of the land and you're getting your own general contractor to build the house and you're putting that together. I used to do those loans. I don't anymore. The reason being is once COVID came, a lot of the, they were never popular to begin with, but a lot of the investors got out of the market from doing it and they haven't come back. And the couple that have seem to have a real, you know, foothold on, on everything as far as they're with a lot of companies, you know, that do it. And the communication process was just very hard. And it got to the point where I felt as though I was doing a disservice to my clients because it was such an awful hard experience. So I, I just personally stopped doing them. Um, so if anyone is going to go that route, I would say you would want to go to a local bank. There's definitely a lot involved. It's going to be, you know, generally it, it's two closings usually. Um, if not, it's one. There's definitely higher fees on it. And it just depends on are you closing on the land and then you're financing the cost to build the home and then you refinance all that when it's finished into a normal loan or they have a, what's called a one-time close where you do finance the cost of the house and the land in one loan and then the construction begins. It's just, it's a little different, but kind of like what Michael was alluding to, if you go that route, you have to get all the permits yourself. You got to, um, you know, all the engineering reports and that is an extremely lengthy and expensive experience, which is why a lot of people, once they start looking into it from what I've been told anyway, they back out. Um, I've talked with a couple different agents that have done cost comparisons over the average price per square foot of existing homes today in new construction. And the new construction is generally double, if not triple, what it is for an existing home, which it really comes down to the, I mean, everyone knows, you know, if anyone's gone to a Home Depot or Lowe's recently, you know what building materials are like. I mean, a sheet of plywood's ninety dollars, you know. Um, so that in itself is two to three times more than what it used to be. But that whole application and the permit, and the engineering, and the plans, and the like that part is so expensive because you got to get a road in there, your electricity, your utilities. It's it's a lot of work. The other thing that is what I do and what I see a lot of people leaning to when they do go for new construction is when you have a builder that's already purchased the land, they've already done all the permits and everything, and they're basically doing a subdivision. Uh, you know, some subdivisions come on half acre lots, some come on 10 acre lots. Uh, it just depends on where it is. And with that, that's basically a normal loan. You just don't close for six or eight months until it's built. So if you went under contract today, you might not close till December. Um, it means you're not locking in an interest rate for a while but that is considered the same process as just a normal loan. You're just doing it down the road. Um, now to, so. to, uh, to, to add uh, a, a counterpoint to Chris here, here is that one of the things you do get, if you want to do it that way, in other words, work with a builder is that you can probably get the, an agree to price locked in up front. Whereas in this particular marketplace, and when you're talking to, you know, the issues with uh, buying a house is that uh, um, it, it, it's very difficult to know what to bid on this house. I mean, people, people are bidding, especially not so much on the, on the multi-units where they tend to look more at the cash flow uh, type of situation and they're uh, more from an investor point of view. But when they're getting into buying a personal home, there's so much emotional buying involved that um, you know, we, can look up, we can look up comps and, and give you all of the comps in terms of dollars per square foot and all of that. And for, but when you've got 40 people that are all going to make offers on that house and they, they look around and they see, oh my God, I got, I got to compete against all these other people. You have really no idea what the, uh, where, that, where the listing price is going to end or the, or the sales price is going to end up. And I've seen situations where a home that, uh, that were listed for $450,000 ended up selling for almost $625,000. And um, I mean, that's, that's amazing. And that's, that's the kind of market we live in today. Um, so um, 
that's the other side of the coin. I mean, if you if you're going after homes, you 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 it's going to be very rare to uh, that you're going to get that home uh, close to that listing price. You're going to have to expect that uh, that you're going to have to bid above that listing price, and so you need to think about you know what is the you know what are what types of homes are you looking at? Because if you're going to have to bid it up and you have a prequal that's, uh, that's uh, capped at some number, then you're going to have to say, well, if I'm going to have to, if I'm going to, have to go up 40% over the listing price, you know, what should I be looking at? And I mean, I think that's, that this needs to, to play into uh, uh, as a real factor into, into your thinking uh, as you look at homes. And that brings Thank up, an, yes. We have, we have a question. Um, is it safe to say that most homes are selling above the list price? And is there an average amount over that price? And then um, did the panelists uh, on the call offer above listing price? Um, it is absolutely, uh, I wouldn't say it's 100%, but I would say that it is darn close to a 100% issue that, that almost all homes today in this marketplace uh, end up selling for above listing price. And again, it's not so true. It's not so true with multi units, but, um, and, and also if the home is in a, in a more rural area um, and uh, has some other issues with it, uh, it may be a lot closer to the listing price, but if it's in one of the hot areas, um, uh, it's going to go significantly above the listing price. Now, it's not the same, level of war, of, of pricing war that we had um, um, half a year ago or nine months ago, but it's still going up. And I don't, I don't have any idea how long that's going to last. And, and uh, if anybody does know that, I'd like, I'd like to know it, but, uh, but um, it is, uh, it is uh, the case. Um, so, uh, Andrea, did, uh, I don't remember the, the actual details. How much percentage-wise above the listing price did you guys, did you guys uh, pay? We paid no. the lowest no. listing. Oh, you actually did that? We, yes. So when we were looking, we decided we didn't want to get into all the bidding wars. It was too stressful. So we kind of focused on houses that had been on the market for a little while. Because we figured maybe there's something wrong with them that we might not mind is, that other people did. Um, and I guess supposedly with this house, it was just that the uh, the realtor was sick for a while with COVID and they didn't want anybody else to show it. So they just kind of put it off for a while. But we came, we we offered under under a listing price and we got it. Well, not not our original offer. We offered 280. They were asking 299. We offered 285 and we ended up paying 290. Great. That was that was really a good. I remember that now. That yeah. uh, that that was a that was a, a really good situation. And it's, and again, it's not always the price. There are other things that come into into play too uh, that you can take advantage of. One thing that uh, that uh, I would like to bring up, and that is, you often see now listings that come up and said that the seller is making the sale contingent upon that seller finding a home to live in. Well, that's an interesting thing because um, a lot of people don't want to wait around for the seller to, uh, to uh, find a home because he could wait. In fact, I have this, I have this one client and I mean, this is the ridiculous situation, but uh, uh, we went under contract in a, in a situation uh, like that where the seller wanted to find a, a home to buy. And, um, and we went under contract in October of last year. Well, we're still waiting for the seller to, to find a, 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 a suitable living thing, and you know it's getting a little frustrating for the for the buyers. When are they going to get to move in there? But it does. It is a way to actually where where may, may money doesn't mean all that much because a lot of a lot of buyers don't want to wait. Uh, you know, three or four months before they move into their home, they want to move into it now. So if you can find a home and you and you have the flexibility of being able to wait for a while, um, that that can that can pay that can be in your favor, and you actually could win the offer, or win the bid with a with a price that's lower than some other um, um, uh, buyers gave, but they wanted the house right away. So that is a way, it's one of the things that we look at and one of the strategies that we use and to try to help the buyers in this marketplace. 
But one other thing I wanted to bring up, and that is that when homes get bid up the way a lot of them do, and obviously not all of them, but a lot of them do, um, you can end up with what's called an appraisal gap. And that is that the, the appraiser that comes in, um, well, well, he will use comps and, and uh, that were basically the, the sales price from houses that closed eight weeks ago, 10 weeks ago. And, and as typically uh, those are the types of numbers he uses, but the market may have changed a lot uh, in, in that uh, last two or three months. And the listing, the actual price that, uh, that the sellers, um, uh, the um, offer they accept may be significantly above what the appraiser says that the, the loan, uh, uh, the, um, the value of that house is. The difference between those two numbers is what's called an appraisal gap, and and as a, as a buyer, you need to understand that there are really three areas that you have to get involved with in terms of cash that you will have to put out of your pocket. One is the closing costs and the purchase. The second is the amount of down payment that you have to put down, and the third is, do you want to cover any of that appraisal gap difference? Because a lot of the a lot of the um, um, buyers today will actually put in as a contingency. They say, "Okay, we're willing if the appraisal comes in, uh, say ten thousand dollars or or less um, than uh, our offer, we'll cover the difference." Well, that cash will come out of your pocket, so you have to be prepared to 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 uh, to, to cover that too. And it's again something you need to think about when you're when you're um, uh, looking at the, the house and making the offer. Michael, can I jump in with another question? Absolutely. There are a, a few very rural areas that for years have shown zero property tax. Is that because they're uninhabited or owned by the state or federal government? Chris, do you wanna answer that question? Um, I personally have never heard of a town that didn't have any property taxes. Um, I, I would only imagine there's several, if there's there's several that, that are listed in the state, Low and Burbank's grant and Beans grant, for example, that look like they're in the White Mountains. There's like four or five that show zero. So it's either a fluke of recording or like nobody lives there, or I figured the I feds was, own them or something. I, I don't think gonna, anybody lives there anymore. I was it's just gonna great. say it's it's probably more to the no one lives there. Um, you know. If you look, I know no one's looking at in Maine, obviously, but if you go and look at Maine, you get into real northern rural Maine, and there's a lot of places that don't even have names. It's just TW Township One, you know, because there's just there's just no people. Um, but it is it does have an outline, uh, and there's places in New Hampshire like that too. So if there's no taxes, it's because there's zero services, there's zero anything. One thing that's different about New Hampshire is that the towns touch each other. So where I was raised, we'd have counties and then there'd be the incorporated part in the middle of the county. Um, and here in New Hampshire, the towns go cover the entire state. So there is never a time that you're not in a town, but those towns are, that you're mentioning that have no taxes are, as, as far as I know, I've never drove through, I don't even know if there are still roads, but um, there are no, no housing there. Yeah, I've uh, I've had a, a couple of clients that uh, they they want to find a place that is totally off the grid, and um, it's sort of gotten me into a lot of trouble once in a while because uh, some of these places that are totally off of the grid are way up off of uh, what we would call a class six road, and uh, which are roads that are just in the winter just not maintained by the town. So I, I had this situation that uh, uh, my navigator system took me to this little place and it said, okay, the house is up to the left over here about uh, a quarter of a mile up. So I get on this road and it, the road's not much wider than my car and it's totally not plowed. And I'm going up this road and I'm thinking, you know, wait a minute, there's no other car tracks here. I mean, they may be off the grid, but they, they, they got to get out of there once in a while. Where are the car tracks? So when I look up and there's this big sign that says, 
road closed for the winter. So, so I said, well, this is fine. I can't turn the car around, so I better back out. So I'm backing out and all of a sudden the car starts sliding off the road. And, and luckily it stops right next to this four foot ditch. And, uh, and um, um, I, I, bottom line is I had to get it towed out of there. And uh, um, um, so I learned a lesson, you know, um, if, if there's a class six road, which is, uh, which is totally snowed in, I don't drive up it anymore. I'll walk it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's see. Um, next question was, uh, is it easy to find a rental? Boy, that's, that's a tough question. Um, I, if, if, to, if you're looking for a short-term rental um, to come out here and look uh, um, and spend a, a few weeks looking around, it's, it's pretty easy, I think, to find a rental. If you're looking for a longer-term rental, um, it's a much more difficult situation if you want to have both the flexibility of saying, when I find a house, I want to have a month, I want to be on a month to month rental agreement. Oh, and by the way, I also have three cats and a dog. Um, and um, uh, I think that your chances of finding a rental are very low <laughs> in that situation. So um, uh, yeah, you can, rentals, rentals can be done. Um, um, I, the, obviously, the Airbnb type thing on a short term basis is more expensive, but trying to find something on a longer term basis uh, uh, is definitely possible, um, especially if you don't have pets. Um, or you can actually uh, do something that some of our agents have done, and that is uh, 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 you can purchase a, a multi unit property where you actually live in one of the units. And then when you find a, a property, um, buy that and then rent out the other unit. That, that's, we've done that before. And, and that, that, is a, that is a potential solution. Let's see. How long does it take to buy a home? <laughs> hey, Caitlin, how long did it take you? <laughs> Um, we arrived in New Hampshire at the first week of May. Uh, we'd already technically kind of been looking and we closed on our house the last week of September. So our second house, because technically we were under contract for a different house in June, but that's a story nobody has time for. So it took approximately, I would say five-ish months. Um, but again, I feel like last summer was sort of the height of insanity with home buying. Um, I'm going to knock on wood that that's the case and that I'm not jinxing everyone's work now. Um, I would actually disagree with that. I know Michael said it's slowing down, but I have not noticed any. And I will say Constance but... wrote her shit. Like Constance kind of magical. She made predictions about things and that I worked with her that were truly astounding. So if she thinks that it's not slowing down, then I'm going to roll with that. <laughs> Sorry, and, sorry to and, contradict Michael, but I actually <coughs> feel like the pressure is really up, like where it used to be if you were in a six to eight hundred thousand dollar range, you'd have very few other offers, and now that's not the case. So, so in, in addition to just finding the place and then putting in an offer which gets accepted, you also have to take into account that uh, uh, that as Chris mentioned earlier, if you need, if you're, if this is not a cash offer and you have to have an appraisal done, depending on where this is, that appraisal can take a long time. And um, that's actually in terms of like how long things take. That well, was one of the more unexpected time sucks. Was that our appraisal? took a really long time and we had to have like once it came in it was contested so we had to Chris is nodding his head so that was actually a really unexpected issue um so word to the wise that that can happen that you can think you know you're closing on a certain date and then actually no you're not so just I think when you go into the process of buying a home you have to just accept that you have no idea how long it's going to take and no idea how hard it's going to be and you just are open to the universe and all possibilities and if you have that kind of mindset I think you'll spare yourself a lot of disappointment and frustration if you just expect that it's going to be absolutely crazy yeah and and the um you know I've just, and, and Chris you can back this up I mean I've had situations where if the home is in a more remote area um 
you, you, the, the appraisers, you know, there's, there's just too much business for them and, uh, near home and they, they don't want to go out to those areas. So I think that in one case I was working with Chris, I think we went through 11, I think, uh, different uh, uh, appraisers before somebody actually even picked it up. And um, it's, so it can be a long time, um, when, but if it's, in, if it's in one of the metropolitan areas, it can be very quick. Um, so it's hard to say, but it's, it ha you, have to, you have to assume that it's gonna take some amount of time to get that appraisal done. Yeah, that's actually where having a local agent with Chris was really helpful because he was able to expedite what was already a crazy process. And I know that his insight and his like savvy were able to keep us from basically being pending to have our appraisal done forever. So that's like one area where having a local agent I think is really helpful. Thank you. And yeah, and every play, every transaction is different. You know, I would definitely say, generally speaking, if you're more in a metropolitan area or suburb of it, generally speaking, now you're looking at five, six weeks for closing from the day I receive the signed purchase and sale agreement, you know, to the day you're at the closing table. If you're in more of a rural area, I would, I would advise you that it would be a 45 to 60 day close you know we put 45 days on most of the contracts uh, but sometimes they have to get extended and some of the appraisers are fantastic um, but unfortunately more are not and more than not are taking a while in those rural areas and then like Caitlin said just because you get it back doesn't mean it's correct uh, there are people too and and some are better than others um, you know, I, I to give you the you know all extremes. I have a file right now where it's taken five weeks to get the appraisal because the appraiser uh, it went through fourteen or fifteen appraisers that rejected it. Uh, one finally accepted it. Uh, we went with a different company to get one to accept it, and she canceled three times for real life stuff. But it was real life stuff that just happened to happen around the day she was supposed to be there. It has finally come in. Uh, it's been, it's gone back to her twice. Uh, and then it, when it came in, it had to go to another review process because it didn't, it had all these marks that just didn't, weren't right. And there's a lot of legit things that were brought up uh, and it's now back with her. And it looks like we're not gonna close on time uh, because of that. I have another file where the appraisal was ordered last Friday. The appraiser was there on Monday. And I got it on Wednesday. So some people it's are just different <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> you know, they're they're all different. But on average, your average appraisal is taking about a three-week turn time. Okay, let's see. I think that is it. If um, I think we're almost out of time anyway, but are there any questions or if you um, um, want to write the questions in, uh, definitely be uh, willing to get back and, and answer the questions uh, on a more one-on-one uh, -on -one basis. Amy, do you have anything that we uh, need to cover before we sign off? No new questions. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, thank you, panelists. I appreciate your, your uh, inputs. And um, um, I hope that all the people watching this uh, uh, didn't get discouraged uh, and uh, are uh, um, more eager than ever to come into New Hampshire because we need you here. And uh, Porcupine is ready to help. Um, wherever you want to find a place, uh, whether it's a single family home or a multi-unit home, um, uh, we're here to help you. So um, thank you again and, and have a great evening.